The work that we're doing here could be widely applicable across the eastern seaboard, Delaware, Virginia, the Carolinas, Louisiana, but also there, this is not just happening in the United States. So um, Vietnam and Bangladesh are two coastal countries that are really impacted by saltwater intrusion. And we grow the majority of the world's rice in those two, in those two countries. So there's these large scale impacts for food security. Saltwater intrusion is the landward movement of seawater. And it has the ability to make our drinking water undrinkable and it can create a really salty environment for a lot of our coastal crops. It basically means that they're sitting in a sort of salt water pool and they're trying to take up pure water, but they're finding only salt. So we found this field because we've been working closely with our partners at the Department of Natural Resources. And so one of the fellows there, he farms this field and let us know that he was having a lot of problems with like salt encroachment. He could tell that the crops weren't doing very well. This was a corn and soy rotation. And so we asked if we could plant some field trials and that's what we're standing in here today. As we go this way behind me, the land gets a little higher and the salt water hasn't been up on that portion yet. So you can see the difference between what happens. But as, as the salt water uh, comes onto the farmland, it absorbs the salt and makes it difficult to grow crops, if not at all, you know. We do have uh, an annual meeting where they, they bring up different plants and how different sorts of uh, seeds have done in certain areas. And for the most part, a lot of what I, I see is kind of what I may have already known. But until you do the actual research, it's all speculation. So these are trials to look at alternative crop rotations of sorghum, like this plant here barley and a salt tolerant soybean, but then also some um, restoration alternatives. So this is uh, Spartina patens, which is a native marsh plant to this region. And then behind that is a switchgrass species. And switchgrass is a, it's not necessarily very salt tolerant, but it's a very fast growing species that could have some alternative uses like biofuels, but also maybe poultry bedding. We started noticing uh more land being uh, salt intruded, primarily after Isabel, which was hurricane that hit here in September of 2003. And it seems like the sea level, at least since that time, has e exaggerated to the point where it happens more often. Notice here, there's in some areas of the field, there's actually bare patches, and those are almost like a positive feedback loop. So as the vegetation dies down, more and more salts can evaporate. So you actually get these really salty patches where nothing can grow. It's not as if I've lost a lot of land. I've only lost maybe 8% of what I was farming, which is, is a good bet, but there's places and farmers I know that have lost 100% of the land that they farm. And, you know, of course, trying all these different things gives us the ability to know whether or not we should continue to farm it or not farm it. For a farmer's bottom line, trying to work in an environment like this is really challenging. And so we're trying to look for alternatives that might make it so that as their farms are transitioning, if the land is really going to become a marsh, how long can they farm it and what are those options available to them? This is an area where uh, both freshwater and tidal water kind of concentrates uh, once or twice during the summer. This year we've been exceptionally wet years. And, uh, you know, it, instead of maybe having a, a high tide event once every year, we, we have high tide events probably six to eight times a year now compared to maybe one, if any. So to me, it seems pretty dramatic. So we started this in 2015. And then we got some funding from the Harry Hughes Center for Agroecology, which really sort of was our first seed grant that helped us really get this, this research off the ground and helped fund some of the, the stuff you see here today. And that enabled us to get a National Institute for Food and Ag grant, which is NIFA through the USDA. And then that enabled us to get a grant from the National Science Foundation just a couple weeks ago. Um, that, that, and it will continue this work and then also expand to Virginia and Delaware. I mean, so I'll just say I love working in Maryland <laughs> because um, Maryland is, in terms of environmental work, is just always trying to be like at the cutting edge and is really thinking hard about these questions. So, you know, I named some of our funders, but we also are working with the Maryland Department of Planning, Maryland Department of Natural Resources, 
um, Maryland Department of the Environment, Maryland um, Department of Agriculture, all the soil conservation uh, district offices, or many of them, and the Maryland Geological Survey. And what's great is everyone wants to know what we can do about this, and so we've been working like really, you know, seamlessly and very much hand in hand with all of those um, agencies in Maryland. It's been really wonderful. I feel like we need to at least look into everything possible to maybe lessen the, the frequency or continue to do some of the things we've been doing previously. Uh, and, and you know, it, it's, to me, it's just the interest of, of knowing all of our options. There are many reasons why an everyday Marylander uh, should care about saltwater intrusion. Um, the first is that we all love the Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> it's this iconic natural resource for the world, the entire United States. And uh, the impact of saltwater intrusion could be quite catastrophic for water quality in the Chesapeake Bay. So it's, it is something that we should care about just on a sort of that, that personal level of caring for our natural resources. On the eastern seaboard and then in Maryland, where some, uh, some of our communities are actually some of the first to be hit by this slow burn of climate change. And so I often think of this as it's like our duty to figure out how we can manage on this edge as our, as our coastlines transition. And I think that it's important to not ignore the farming community. And so these people are our neighbors. And so we can help support our neighbors with science-based solutions. That might be an adaptation um, to a crop rotation. It might be taking some land out of agriculture and putting it in some kind of easement program. But then we also need to know like what crops are gonna grow, what plants are gonna grow. So I think there's lots of ways that as Marylanders, we can think about the importance of this as protecting this iconic natural resource at Chesapeake Bay, but also helping our communities thrive.